Thank you all for uh, staying with us today. We're lucky to have our keynote speaker here today. Alan Weil is the Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, a multidisciplinary journal, uh, the leading journal in the intersection of health, health care, and health policy. He's had that position since June 1, 2014. Before that, for about a decade, he was the Executive Director of the National Academy for State Health Policy, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit research and policy organization. Before that, he directed the Urban Institute's Assessing the New Federalism Project, one of the largest privately funded social policy research projects that's ever been undertaken in the U.S. He held a cabinet position as executive director of the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, and was assistant general counsel in the Massachusetts Department of Medical Security. He's a frequent speaker on state health policy, Medicaid, federalism, implementation of the ACA, and about half a dozen other topics. He's an elected member of the National Academies of Medicine, spent six years on the NAM and its predecessor, the Institute of Medicine's Board on Healthcare Services. He's a member of the Kaiser Foundation on Medicaid and Insured on the Board of Trustees of the Consumer Health Foundation in Washington, D.C. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and we're happy to say a JD here at HLS. I've had the pleasure of hearing him speak several times before, and it's really a treat for all of us. So, Alan, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I remember attending a brief uh, set of meetings early in the creation of the center and learned a lot about what the plans were. I've had a little exposure over the years and have had the pleasure of publishing with you and your colleagues. Uh, it is truly an honor to be back here. Uh, I'm sure, like others, when I was a student here, I never imagined I would come back and actually stand up in front of people and speak. I certainly didn't imagine I would speak here since this building didn't, didn't even exist at the time. Uh, but it's great to be here and to help you uh, celebrate your 10th uh, anniversary. Um, uh, Glenn gave a quick picture of health affairs. We are the leading health policy journal in the United States. Uh, we are a peer-reviewed journal, so we're really bringing scholarship to the field. But we write for a policy audience, and so it's an interesting hybrid uh, trying to navigate both uh, the academic setting as, and the, the uh, rigors of peer review as well as the policy environment. When I was named as editor-in-chief of Politico, which is this uh, Washington rag that reports on all things political, uh, it said that I was the first lawyer to be the editor of Health Affairs. Uh, I thought that was an interesting choice for them to highlight First of all, I'm only the fourth editor, it's not like there have been 30 of us. Um, and uh, I, it's true I'm a lawyer, but I, haven't, uh, I don't come out of legal practice. But what I really was was not a journalist, and the, the journal comes out of the tradition of journalism. But as I arrived, and I read what uh, someone else thought was important about my arrival, uh, I was struck by the fact that uh, despite my legal training, um, I don't see a lot of legal writing in the journal. We don't get a lot of submissions from the legal community. I wouldn't say we get none, but we don't get a lot. And I have been confronted uh, from the time that I took over the post with the question of uh, why isn't there more legal scholarship in the nation's leading health policy journal? There's certainly plenty of legal scholarship related to health. And so when I was asked to come today, I thought uh, maybe I ought to think about this question and try to give a tentative answer. And so my discussion with you uh, this afternoon is really about how we might bridge some of the gap between legal scholarship and health policy and uh, bring the legal voice more into the policy debate. Now I want to be clear at the outset uh, that although I did get a JD from this fine institution, I have never practiced law. I don't consider myself a legal scholar. I'm not really up on the legal literature. Uh, I hopefully am quite up on the health policy literature. And so when I approach this topic, I approach it more from the policy side of the street than the uh, legal side of the street. And uh, that does run the risk coming to the law school that I'll say things 
wrong. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of can't help but address this issue by uh, uh, taking it from the perspective of where I work every day. And I think in the policy community, for the non-legal members of that community, uh, the sense of what is the intersection between law and policy is very much driven by high-profile court cases. So, you know, everyone knows that the Affordable Care Act is being challenged, is being heard in front of the Supreme Court, uh, and this is what legal issues have to do with health care. And uh, I think that's a very narrow perspective, uh, but that's where much of the intersection uh, is perceived. I also think it arises in very uh, finite areas, discussions of bioethics, for example, for antitrust, for places that people really understand that those there are core legal intellectual property, uh, other kinds of issues. But the notion that legal issues suffuse health policy, I don't think, is uh, broadly understood. And so to illustrate what I think some of the gaps are and how we might bring them together, I thought I would describe uh, four instances taken from different places of how I see the difference between how the law looks at the issues and how policy, health policymakers look at them, and to try to draw some lessons from them. And I'll just say at the outset, these four, uh, I could have picked 20. Uh, I could have picked four different ones. You might pick four others but I just thought I would pick ones that reflect a variety of angles on this issue of the relationship between health policy and law. So let's start with the highest profile. Uh, I'm gonna take NFIB versus Sebelius, the core challenge to the Affordable Care Act, but I'm gonna focus in on the surprise half of the decision, which is the Medicaid portion of the decision where the Supreme Court, uh, on the uh, basically deciding a issue of constitutional federalism, decided that the very strong financial incentives that uh, the federal government was giving to states to expand their Medicaid programs, that the incentive was so good it was an offer they couldn't refuse and therefore was unconstitutionally coercive and unenforceable uh, through the traditional mechanisms of enforcement within the Medicaid statute, which is that the secretary can withdraw funds from the state. Now, those of us, I think, whether you were coming at this from more of a policy space or a legal space, you probably remember at the time that almost everyone's focus when that opinion uh, was expected, everyone's focus was on the question of the mandate and, and whether or not the overall structure of the law would stand. People found the challenge against the Medicaid provisions to be sort of a non-issue, and yet that's where uh, the court landed. And um, I've always found, and, and this is not a, I, I don't want to focus too much on the case itself, but I have always found the image of the, of the court's opinion here somewhat odd. The notion that basically if an offer is too good to turn down, that makes it coercive. It's like, here, take my money, and that be, that's a coercive act. Uh, but that is basically the way uh, the court saw it. But if you look at, you know, what's interesting to me also is that a lot of the interest groups in Washington had prepared their responses to the opinion knowing that it was coming down. And they had written three or four versions depending on what outcome was going to happen. And then they all had to rip them up and write a brand new one because this was such an unexpected uh, outcome. That's how the community saw it at the time. The legal elements of the discussion at the time were, I think, the kinds of questions that you would ask when confronted with uh, this new opinion. Well, if 100% of payment is too much of an incentive uh, and therefore is coercive, what about if the federal government offers to pay 90%? What about 80%? At what point does an incentive become coercive? Uh, similarly, the court didn't strike down the expansion, which by the way resides in a mandatory portion of the statute, as in states must implement this provision, the Medicaid expansion still resides as a mandatory provision. It's just not enforceable. What does that mean? That seems like a pretty good legal question. There were questions about whether states could do a partial expansion. They were required under the law to cover everyone up to 133% of poverty. Could they go to 100? Could they go to 50? Could they go to 80 under this? new uh, uh, regime that we were under 
uh, court decision. And similarly, given that the reason it was coercive is that, in theory, the secretary could withhold all of the state's Medicaid funding if the state didn't do this one provision, aside from the fact that the secretary has never, in, in his or her history, have exercised that remedy, would there be a way to make this constitutionally permissible if we just changed the remedy but didn't change the overall structure of the expansion? These are the kinds of legal questions that arose, and they're the natural ones that one might ask. But the policy community was looking at a different set of issues. The immediate reality was that the reason the Affordable Care Act uh, effectuated half of the expansion uh, under the Affordable Care Act through Medicaid is because it's cheaper, <coughs> because Medicaid takes lower provider rates, and because the administrative structure is already in place in contrast to the new health insurance exchanges which had to be created. So the policy community was asking questions like, how are we going to provide coverage to all these people who now aren't going to get it unless the states choose uh, this expansion, which they we thought was going to be mandatory? Will states elect to expand? What additional encouragement might it take for states to act? Is there a possibility of creating some sort of a federal fallback of, of coverage if states don't act that doesn't violate this uh, constitutional federalism uh, issue? But then, even beyond those immediate issues, were a set of broader policy questions, which is the entire healthcare sector, indeed the entire social policy sector of the United States, is based on principles of fiscal federalism, where the federal government gives states and other parties financial incentives to participate in programs, and it does so to encourage behavior, and that's just how we do things. Are we no longer going to be able to do that? Think about when Congress enacted the Children's Health Insurance Program. Uh, we had uh, millions of children without health insurance, all of whom could have at that time been covered by Medicaid, but states were not covering them. So Congress says, we'll dangle a higher federal match rate. We'll give you more money to cover these kids as an incentive to expand. No one questioned the constitutionality that now questionable? Uh, when we went through a recession and the federal government gave extra matching funds to states as part of the Recovery Act, it required that states not scale back their eligibility if they were going to get those extra dollars. Is that unconstitutional coercion? Basically, from a policy perspective, the question was not just the boundaries, but really the underpinning of our entire approach to social programs in the United States and health programs in particular. Let me move to a second example, a much more recent, uh, Gobey versus Liberty Mutual just decided about a month ago. This is also a federalism case. I love federalism. Uh, but, uh, but it's a statutory case. It's not constitutional. It's really about whether ERISA uh, preempted Vermont from collecting information about claims paid by uh, self-funded uh, health plans. Uh, again, the legal questions really centered around interpretation of the statute because this was a statutory case. Uh, ERISA uh, 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 preempts state actions, and the legal questions are wow, we've just found this whole new area of preemption. How big is it? How big of a burden on self funded plans really is too much? Uh, everyone, uh, when they start studying ERISA, starts with Traveler's case, it's Traveler's you know, in letter. Um, and in an unusual step, the court sent back to the Sixth Circuit uh, Self Insurance Institute of America versus Snyder. That case was about money, not about administrative data. And so that raises a whole new legal question about whether ERISA preempts states' abilities to raise funds from self funded plans, which is a long standing source of for states. Again, Terrific, interesting legal questions. But the policy community looked at this issue and the decision in a somewhat different way. Again, looking at the specific context, Vermont was trying to create an all-payer claims database. No one else, the federal government, had not done so uh, in order to control costs and pursue its approach to health reform. Vermont, as other about 20 other states, had tried to do this, and now we're told they couldn't. So the policy questions are, how do we achieve our goals if we can't do it this way? Can we collect 
Can we collect the data from a different source, uh, providers, for example? And clearly, under ERISA, the federal government does have authority. This is a statutory case, not constitutional. Could we convince the Department of Labor that has jurisdiction over ERISA to promulgate regulations to achieve this if the state cannot? Uh, how are we going to fill the funding gaps if the, uh, the Sixth Circuit uh, reached the opposite conclusion now in the wake of GoBay? And again, the, not just with the immediate issues, but states were stepping back and looking at the policy context. So since 1945, under McCarran-Ferguson, states have been able to regulate insurance. And then along comes ERISA in, 19, in the mid-'70s, and it says, no, no, there are limits on that when it comes to employer benefits. And we thought we had some stability in the division of labor in regulation of insurance. Uh, HIPAA, which everyone knows because you sign the HIPAA forms and you think of it as a law having to do with uh, privacy, also was the first federal intervention in state insurance regulation, uh, pr providing that if you have continuous coverage, you cannot, uh, you have to have a product made available. You can't be excluded from the insurance market. So the federal government under HIPAA starts regulating insurance, and then un under the Affordable Care Act, the federal government basically takes over the rules of commercial insur health insurance, which had been under uh, state regulation for decades. So the policy question in Gobey is not just one of ERISA, uh, the, not just the legal question of, of the reach of ERISA, but a really fundamental policy question, which is if we've built the Affordable Care Act on coverage expansions, uh, some Medicaid and some insurance exchanges, both of which are run by the states, if we're loading more and more responsibility on states when it comes to program administration and cost containment, and we're simultaneously taking away their tools to manage those programs through preemption, uh, how do you expect states to be successful in the charge that we've given them if we're simultaneously taking away their tools? It's a much bigger question than what's the reach of ERISA. Those are the kind of questions that were uh, being discussed in the policy and, and at, since this is such a recent decision are uh, still uh, just being understood in the policy community. I'll shift to a third case, which is very different. Again, I picked from different domains because I think the differences are as important as the similarities. If you're in state health policy, one, uh, one case that everyone knows uh, is Olmstead uh, versus LC, case out of Georgia in 1999. It's a case uh, based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, and uh, just uh, less than a decade after its enactment, uh, the Supreme Court says basically that if you're a person with disabilities under the, uh, under the, uh, 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 under the ADA, the state has to provide you with community-based options for care. We can't force you uh, inst into institutional care. And of course, in this country, for decades, we've going through, been going through a process of deinstitutionalization, but it has been gradual and it's had lots of barriers. And particularly in the South, uh, the transition to community care has been slower. And here comes the Supreme Court and says, uh, this is an option that you have to make available. This is 1999. We're going back uh, a, a little ways. So again, a whole host of legal questions come up in the wake of Olmstead. Uh, what is uh, the reasonable accommodation that the state has to provide? Is there really a legal uh, uh, statutory under the ADA right to community-based care. If you think about the history of the ADA, it was about non-discrimination. Is this a form of discrimination? What's the reach of this court case? Those were the kinds of questions that followed uh, in, in the wake of Olmstead. The policy uh, context, again, is quite, uh, quite a bit broader than the legal context. So in Medicaid, which is, it, it, Olmstead wasn't specifically a Medicaid case, but it, it, its major application is to Medicaid. In the Medicaid program, if you are in need of, of, of significant supports in daily living, you are entitled to care in a nursing home. You are not entitled to care in the community. That's built into the federal statute. And remember, Olmstead's a statutory decision. It's based on the ADA. This isn't a constitutional right. So gradually, states have been replacing, swapping people out of nursing homes 
helping support them in the community through waiver programs known loosely as home and community-based waivers. But waiver programs are not an entitlement. And so states run waiting lists based on the budgets that they have available. And they'll create slots to provide people, elders and people with disabilities, with services in the home and in the community. But when they run out of money, they run a waiting list because it's not an entitlement. And so they aren't required to provide the services. If the person wants a bed in a nursing home, which very few people do, that they have to provide because it is an entitlement. So we, here's the ADA saying you have to do something, but the financing statute that is underlying what states are doing uh, says the opposite, which is that you're entitled to a nursing home. You're not entitled to be in the community. So which is it? Meanwhile, insurance, which is what this is all, which is uh, what, what much of this is about, is built on the premise of discrimination. After all, you pay different rates uh, in, in all forms of insurance based on your risk and historically in healthcare, and certainly at the time of Olmsted, uh, you paid much higher rates or you couldn't even get insurance if you had certain health conditions, including disabilities, you were underwritten out of the market. Now that was changed in the Affordable Care Act, but that's a much later development. And we're moving also now into this world of you can pick your term, personalized medicine, patient-centered care, where we're trying to figure out exactly how to tailor services to an individual person based on a much broader profile of their, uh, of, of their uh, genetic makeup as well as their personal preferences. All of that personalization is a type of discrimination, not in the legal sense of the word, but certainly in the colloquial sense of the word. So here we are with Olmsted that's part of a political and, 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 and uh, legal movement to uh, define the boundaries of the ADA, which is something that we really needed, but it's running uh, uh, headlong against a very different uh, discussion going on in the policy community having to do with the nature of the Medicaid entitlement, having to do with the bias towards institutional care, and having to do with the, uh, uh, the inevitable uh, discrimination that occurs in insurance underwriting, which at the time was taken as a given. That's the kind of conversation we were having in the policy community, which is how do we make these pieces fit together? Very different uh, from what some of the legal questions were. The final case I'll mention uh, is uh, Armstrong versus Exceptional Child Center 2015. Uh, a, a fairly obscure case if you weren't in the space, and so uh, like these others, I forgive you if you're not aware of it, and I don't pretend to the legal scholarship of surrounding it, but uh, to those of us uh, watching, uh, the, the outcome of that uh, case was basically that uh, providers of services, this case comes out of, uh, of uh, 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 Medicaid, uh, providers of services have no cause of action to challenge inadequate payment rates in Medicaid. So in Medicaid, you have a statute that says that you have to provide people access to services, and, that, and that's a federal statute. And a provider comes to the court and says the payments are inadequate to meet the statute, and the court says uh, there is a statute that says you have to get paid adequately, but you have no cause of action uh, to enforce it. The only way to enforce it is for HHS, which oversees state Medicaid programs, to sanction the state if the state's rates are inadequate. Uh, so again, this raises all kinds of legal questions. What does it mean to have a right without a remedy? I think that's something they ask you the first week when you're a student here. Um, and this was, uh, to get into the details, this was a Medicaid statutory case, but what's its relationship to Section 1983? When I ran the Medicaid agency in Colorado 20-plus uh, years ago, I had to develop very thick skin because I was served with uh, lawsuits every week. And the vast majority of them came under Section 1983, and they were all saying that I was denying people their rights because I was doing something that violated the federal Medicaid statute, which I was responsible for administering. So how do you, as a legal matter, start to think about the relationship between all of these uh, statutory provisions uh, in what is now the largest healthcare program in the country, Medicaid, uh, with 
an evolution in jurisprudence that says uh, there can be rights without remedies or those remedies can be limited to administrative processes, but the, pers the, the parties that are actually uh, harmed have no ability to seek recourse. This is a pretty interesting set of legal issues. Again, though, the policy community not really you know, focused on issues like remedies is asking a somewhat different set of questions. Um, if enforcement is up to uh, HHS, then what's their capacity to do so? Uh, how would they challenge a state? You could almost circle back around, although this case uh, uh, is, has a very different uh, history than NFIB, you could almost circle back around and say, at what point does HHS's enforcement become coercive, which then uh, undermines the entire constitutional structure of the Medicaid program? I mean, really, everything is on the table at this point if we're moving to an aggressive uh, posture of federal enforcement against states, which is something that really has never been done. But we also have to put it in the broader context of how uh, delivery of public programs is changing. That if you go back to the creation of the Medicaid statute, if you go back to what the healthcare system looked like, looked like in those days, uh, we had a fee-for-service system where basically people had a Medicaid card, they would go get services, and the pr provider of those services would be reimbursed for them. And the entitlement to services was to the individual. And lo and behold, now they had a claim attached to them that provided payment to, the, uh, to a hospital or a doctor. But the healthcare system and the programs that are administered under these statutes have changed dramatically. The dominant uh, method of care, of organizing care in Medicaid now, is, is managed care. Uh, man a managed care is a contract between the state and the health plan. Uh, similarly, uh, one of our few bipartisan expansions of coverage is the Children's Health Insurance Program, and the CHIP program is, in statute, clearly not an entitlement, meaning that uh, if the state uh, wants to run a waiting list or simply not determine people eligible, it's not violating any federal law, quite different from how things are in Medicaid. Fundamentally, in the real world, what's happening is we're taking one by one these entitlement programs, which have had an entire jurisprudence built around them about uh, what people, what services uh, people are entitled to them, entitled to under them, and we are one by one converting them into private contracts where the state or the federal government under Medicare managed care is contracting with private plans to deliver the services. Now, legally, the right of the beneficiary to the services has not changed, but the mechanism by which they obtain those services and the mechanism for uh, redress if they feel that they're not getting the services to which they're entitled is completely changing. Similarly, we see a proliferation of state waivers uh, um, enabling them to alter their programs, uh, raising questions like, does the legal status of entitlement to the beneficiary change when the state enters into a waiver with the federal government and changes its relationship to the federal government? Um, as a legal matter, I would say the boundary between legal entitlement and uh, insurance contract is getting blurred as a policy matter. The question is, how do you really guarantee people meaningful uh, access to the services they need uh, in this uh, hodgepodge of entitlement uh, with its evolving jurisprudence of enforcement as well as contract, which is not really set up as a mechanism of enforcement uh, for these kinds of benefits. Uh, we're talking at the national level about, uh, periodically there's discussion of changing Medicaid into a block grant or changing Medicare into a program called premium support, which basically turns it into private insurance premiums. How, how do you really assure availability of benefits under those kinds of changes? So I hope you'll uh, forgive the rapid fire uh, tour of four different cases, but I wanted to draw from different places, constitutional, statutory, uh, federalism, ADA, uh, um, and, and the like, to give you a sense of the, the many issues that I think are really out there that have a legal angle and that have a policy angle. 
So as I finish, I just want to try to take those examples and draw them into this question of the gap between legal and uh, legal policy and health policy. Now I got, as Glenn said, I got a, a joint degree from the Kennedy School as well as the law school, and I enjoyed both programs. I actually found myself as someone who was really into policy more drawn to the legal side of it than what I had over at the Kennedy School. Of course, when I give a lecture at the Kennedy School, I say the opposite. Just kidding. But I, I mean, really, I found it more, more engaging uh, over here. And I thought, why is that? And I think it comes back to why we have the gap that we do, which is that the legal discourse is one, and certainly understanding the evolution of, of court cases, is one of line drawing. Every new decision adds a puzzle piece to uh, the puzzle. Uh, we recalibrate our understanding of what is and isn't possible. Basically, the law is this huge logic puzzle, which is what I, you know, as a geek uh, did for recreation when I was a kid. And legal scholarship is about extending the puzzle and understanding it and getting into one piece and taking it apart and really getting at what's inside that piece and thereby expanding our understanding of the overall legal structure. It's very intellectually satisfying. Um, the policy work is really very different. It asks the question, how do people get stuff done? And the interaction with law is, we thought we'd figured out how to get it done. We thought we were going to do it this way. And now it turns out we can't. Or someone's doing something we don't like, and we're going to challenge it legally. And now, ha-ha, they can't. But they're going to come back at us with a different way of trying to do it. And now we have to figure out how to prepare and defend against their alternative approach, since we, uh, we, we headed them off at the pass once. But they're going to come around the other side. Fundamentally, it's less intellectually satisfying. Um, the problem is it's actually how the real world works. And so if you want to engage with the real world, you have to get out of the intellectual satisfaction of the legal machine and into the messiness of the political machine. So when I think about closing the gap, I think about the experience of the discipline of economics, which was my undergraduate major. Um, economics has won the battle in public policy. My journal is filled with papers written by economists. Uh, whether that's a good thing or not, we can discuss at the reception. Um, you know, um, because economists have figured out, first of all, that economic issues underlie health policy, that's without question. But they've also figured out something different, which is they figured out how to take the core economic discipline and continue to run it as they have while also creating a more applied discipline of health economics that speaks the language of health policy and economics. And it's not as beautiful methodologically. The papers have fewer formulas than you'd find in the American Economics Review, but they speak to a different audience. And they figured out also with a lot of work how to provide professional rewards to economists who play on the health side, as well as the sophisticated economic method side. So it seems to me that the challenge for law is to think, not emulate, but to think about the same issues. There is no question in my mind that legal issues suffuse health, uh, health policy. I, I, it's everywhere to be seen. But we need to think of the applied legal work in health policy in some of the same ways that economists have done so, adopting the language of policy, leaving behind some of the arcana of legal scholarship, letting you publish those legal scholarship pieces in the, legal, in the law review so you can get tenure, but also having professional rewards associated with bringing that scholarship to the policy community. Um, I think the center has... Uh, made uh, efforts in this direction. I don't think one institution can do it alone. But fundamentally, I think closing this gap would make legal scholarship more rewarding. It would make it more practical. I think it would lead to better health policy, easy for me to say, because I, as a lawyer, I see those issues everywhere. And it might even make my job as editor-in-chief in, at health affairs a little easier and a little more rewarding as well. And I know that that's not what motivates you, but it motivates me a little bit. And so I hope 
both for us and for you in your uh, careers, as well as for the country as a whole, we can put some uh, more significant effort into closing this gap and uh, helping uh, legal scholarship speak more clearly to health policy. I think we need it. I think we could uh, use it. And I, as the editor, would welcome it. Thank you very much. Hello, Mark Rodwin. Um, liked your talk very much, and I was fascinated the examples you, you uh, chose, because actually Health Affairs has done some um, brilliant uh, articles, uh, Sarah Rosenbaum, Tim Jost, on uh, the um, disappearing of the entitlement uh, on the Armstrong case, and um, so it's not as if you haven't found scholars out there to do it. My question then is this. Um, or my theory is this, it seems to me one of the strengths and weaknesses of uh, lawyers and legal training is they're advocates. And uh, empirical legal studies are, are is newer. And the articles I mentioned were able to fit in health affairs because they looked at precedents and looked at this as an empirical uh, issue. I think if people submit articles that are more in the realm of advocacy and an argument about why the law should be one way or the other, which is done somewhat in the law journal sometimes, that might not fit so well with the tradition of health affairs of trying to have uh, a strong empirical base, a strong factual base, maybe a quantitative base, and then a little bit of discussion of the implications for that. Um, am I reading this correctly yeah. uh, or not? So first, uh, let, let me s uh, first address the first thing you said. I, I would never want to suggest that uh, legal scholarship is absent from the policy discourse. Uh, and you, you cite two examples, and there are others of you know, wonderful scholars who we publish, and Tim Jost is our most popular blogger. Uh, a lot of what he does is translate very complex legal issues into language that the policy community feels like they can get their head around. And that's a hard thing to do, and no one does it like him, uh, which is why he's such a great resource uh, for us. And Sarah, a very close colleague of mine I've worked with for many years, uh, is one of a small share of the health of, of the legal community. I mean, she, you know, she's in a medical school. She's not in a law, on a law faculty. Um, but she's really getting back to Einer's uh, comment. I mean, she's really on the public program side. She's a, a, a scholar. Uh, you mentioned you know, Armstrong and the like uh, in that area. So I'm not suggesting somehow that, we're, uh, we're, we're, that there are no, no people out there. I just think the, the, the size of the contribution from the legal community relative to the number of issues uh, that you all could weigh in on is, is modest. And, I don't want, and I'm not also, I don't want this to just be about health affairs. I mean, we have our own standards, but I think in the policy discourse in general, I mean, Washington's filled with lawyers, but uh, they're not filled with lawyers talking about legal issues. They're mostly lawyers talking about advocacy, which brings me to the second half of your comment and question. Uh, you know, I'm not sure I'm with you in the sense that I don't think we reject a lot of papers from lawyers because they're too advocacy oriented. I, I, I don't think that's our, I don't think that's the barrier. Um, I think what, what it, it is, however, the empirical side, which is the need to take the issues and present them uh, with an empirical grounding, but also in, in a language that's accessible to the policy community. I guess I think the weak link is much more around policy relevance and accessibility than around advocacy. If, I, if you just asked me off the top of my head, what's the biggest barrier? The biggest barrier is something that moves legal scholarship forward uh, is not directly likely moving policy discourse forward. You really have to translate, and not many people do that. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about your opinion on whether you think electing lawyers and, and, and the president and, and other issues will more likely result in law and policy intersecting. Well, if we, uh, if we ran, I, I guess we can't really run a randomized controlled trial on that, but I think we know that 
uh, lawyers uh, are the largest, I think we know that they're the largest uh, segment of Congress. I'm not so sure uh, the presidency is the, the key issue here. Um, I, I guess I would flip the question to the other side, which is given that we give such a major role to lawyers in our policymaking process, shouldn't we be able to find a way to bring the issues that these people were trained in more central to their discussion than it is right now? So, and I, 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 I worried a little bit about throwing it in the economists at the end, but I think it really is quite a telling story that, and I was, you know, I, I was a student here with critical legal studies and then the beginning of the law and economics movement and all of that and the fight over how much should this all be about economic incentives. And I had the good fortune as an undergraduate to study under a subsequent uh, Nobel laureate in behavioral economics, George Akerlof, who, start, you know, who starts to then create the counter argument, which is sure it's economics, but it's not neoclassical economics. It's, it's, it's much more complex than that. I think economics has figured out how to tease out the economic angle in all kinds of issues in ways that make sense to people and get in the discussion, I would argue, more than they should. If we have a bunch of lawyers making policy, ought we not be able to figure out the same thing? That's sort of the challenge I would pose. So I don't think it's so much the, t the, the, the letters after the official's name, as the fact that these processes are inherently legal, and therefore the discourse ought to be more inherently legal. Alan, I wonder if I could get you to reflect a little bit about the way in which health policies become increasingly partisan and the way in which the role of law kind of interfaces with that. So one thing that is an interesting data point, let's say, is the lack of seriousness given by many, not everybody in this room, but by many people in this room to the ACA challenges at its early inception and kind of the ability to do risk assessment and whether actually now we're in a world where anytime anyone brings any challenge to the ACA, whether the advice to policymakers would be to take it seriously because our risk assessment might not be, you know, so do you have any thoughts about that? So it's funny, when I was preparing this talk, I had a section that I took out, so now I have to put it back in, which is that I, was tra I wasn't in this job uh, when the ACA was enacted. I was working with states. I did a lot of traveling around the country, and I was stunned by the number of states I went to. And I would speak to legislators all over the country who would say, we're not going to do anything to implement the law because it's going to be overturned by the courts. And they held that view with the same confidence that, you know, I held the view that the Medicaid provisions of the statute uh, were, were that, that their inclusion in the NFIB case was sort of a joke and that there was you know, no, pos no real risk to that provision even though it was before the Supreme Court. Well, we were both wrong. Um, and, but of course, when I heard them, I was sure they were wrong and I was right. I mean, that's, so I'm not sure so much this is partisan, although, I mean, look, there's plenty of partisan, but I'm not sure how much of what you're describing is, is straight partisan as it is sort of, overconfidence in our certainty regarding uh, the evolution of the law. And, you know, it turns out that a lot more is at issue than we thought. And it's not exactly shocking. I mean, we've known the courts, you know, closely divided and the like. So I guess I want to take your, your question and, you know, is, by telling that story, take it in two different directions. I mean, one is, I think it is very difficult right now to look very far ahead, particularly with a vacancy on the court, um, with what the legal framework really is around some very fundamental issues, the meaning of an entitlement, the constitutional boundaries of federalism, the opportunities associated with fiscal federalism, and on and on and on and on. So I think just from a pure thinking about the future, uh, much more is in flux uh, than one would, would like. When it comes to the more purely partisan uh, issues here, I'm not really sure what to say. It is certainly the case that people whose views lean left were very likely before each court case to say it's obvious that the decision will be you know, whatever side they thought it was going to be. 
Um, I, you know, I think that's sort of cloudy thinking more than it is partisanship. And um, so I, you know, there's plenty of partisanship in policy making. I'm not sure I know the relationship across that and the, and the legal scholarship question. Thanks, Alan. So I'll ask you a question that's a variation on one that was um, asked at the, the Law and Bioethics panel, which just is a, a question about when you see law as a valuable tool um, in health policy and where there are certain areas that perhaps should just be left to the doctor-patient relationship to decide or, you know, private ordering to decide and, you know, in particular if there are particular components, right? So we see, um, you know, case law can often be quite messy, but so can legislation, and particularly in health policy, a lot is happening at the state level. So is it good that we have sort of the laboratories of the states to deal with these issues, um, and just generally your perspective on, on law as a tool in health policy? Um, so I, you know, I don't really see, maybe I was here at a time where the first thing I always was taught was, you know, it's not this or that, it's the dialectic between the two, okay? So, sorry, I drank the Kool-Aid and it's still in my system these many decades later. I, I don't think it's a question of whether it's law or left to the relation, private relationship because after all, the nature of those private relationships are structured by the law. And so the rights, I mean, you know, the, the discussion of informed consent and the like, uh, the rights of the patient in that relationship uh, to determine the course of treatment uh, is, a, is, 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 is structured by law. And what we don't tend to talk about a lot is that the financial relationships that have a huge effect on the structure of that physician or, or other clinician uh, relationship with the patient are also clearly a matter of policy and law. And the notion that sort of we're going to set aside the finances, you know, and just have this little dynamic between two uh, equal people when one of them is wearing a paper gown and the other one has a stethoscope wrapped around their white coat, you know, it, it that, it's just doesn't work that way. So I don't really see it as an either or. Um, I'm also sufficiently a product of my undergraduate education at Berkeley to believe in the power of law as a catalyst for, for social change with all of the perils associated with doing so, which is that when the court steps out in front uh, too far, it gets slapped down by the political process, but it also doesn't need to be the last one to the party. And I spent a few minutes uh, on, on Olmstead, which is probably, of the cases I mentioned, probably the one least familiar to folks if they're not really in, uh, in the depths of, of health care delivery. But I mean, Olmstead was, a, you know, is a, it's a civil rights case. It's a case out of uh, the ADA that says, you know, we don't really care all the excuses that states make for why they can't move people out of nursing homes into the community. We, the court, are going to say that when Congress said no discrimination on the basis of disability, these are people with severe disabilities, the fact that we're putting them in nursing homes is clearly discriminatory, and get them out. And, you know, yes, of course, we have to couch it in the language of reasonable accommodation and patient preference and all of that, but the message was loud and clear, which is get them out. And every state, and, and if you look at the data, the, the, the spending that states have made on services uh, to serve people with disabilities and, and elders uh, in need of uh, support with acti activities of daily living, uh, the, the share of that spending that's now in the community relative to nursing home, it's just this constant shift where nursing home spending's down and home community-based service uh, spending is up. Job is certainly not done. So I see you know, the law in that sense, as in uh, court law, as you know, a catalyst or, as, 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 or, or a force for social change. Um, but I can't really, I guess I'm sort of stuck on the original uh, division here. Um, we are in such a, and maybe this is a good place to end, which is, because I hope it goes back full circle to where I started, which is, I did pick four examples, and, 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 but I don't think there's an issue in health policy where you couldn't sit down with a bunch of you in this room and make a long, long list of the legal issues that underlie those policy questions. There's just not a single issue that isn't also a health policy issue that isn't also a legal issue. The question is, 
uh, can our analysis of the legal issues help policymakers figure out how to achieve their goals? And that's really where I end up, and maybe it's my refinement to the answer to the question about uh, uh, lawyers as advocates, which is fundamentally public policy is also about advocates. It's someone trying to make policy uh, do something that they want. And law is a tool uh, for that, not just as an individual party's advocate, but as an advocate for what the legal structure is that would best achieve that goal. Uh, and so it seems to me that the better communication and thinking we have between those legal issues and the policy community that's trying to solve problems, the better odds are that our policy uh, will, be, uh, will reflect uh, what people want uh, and, 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 in, and the democratic processes will reflect you know, the, the, the will of the people. And it seems to me like those are, are worthy goals. So that, that's more where I would point it to, is not sort of an either or, but how do we improve that integration? Okay.